Mm. I was totally not convinced by that. We want to see God enjoy, we want to see them enjoy God forever. Amen? Amen. Wow, that was semi-believable that time, which is kind of a nice way of saying, I don't care if they make it there or not. (laughs) Which will, yeah, which will give you a good perspective on how you really feel about your spouse. And so this is our last week, and today we're calling, this, we're calling this the truth about marriage. And we're boiling everything together in one giant pot, and we want to see this as one final result. Uh, previously, last two weeks, we've talked about myths we believe about marriage. There are lies that we tell ourselves. Hint, they are lies. They are not true. They do not give glory to God, and they are not for the advancement of his kingdom. And so today, we want to talk about the truth about what God has called together. So if you would, would you please stand, and we'll do the reading of God's word today. Our reading comes out of Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 9. I tried to stay out of the Song of Solomon as long as I possibly could, but I love this verse. Song of Solomon, if you could just picture what Jesus Christ says to the church. You have stolen my heart. My sister, my bride, you have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. The word of the Lord, you may be seated. If we could, could we just respond to that prayer of the groom to the bride? We have stolen his heart. He calls us my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart. Let's just respond to him in just a word of prayer today. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this good and wonderful gift that you've called us to today, or to sit before your word and to talk about your great and wonderful union. God, we thank you for the good gift that you've given us in Christ Jesus. God, we thank you for the good and wonderful gift that you've given us in the beautiful union of marriage. Lord, beyond marriage, it's not just a covenant with another person, but it's a covenant before you and with you. God, it's also a covenant with our friendships and our relationships and our children. Lord, even people who are far off and far removed from us, God, we love them because you first loved us. Lord, may we bow in humble, humble, humble response of what you've done for us. Lord, I pray today that you pour through me the gift of preaching, that these words are not my own, but they come from you. God, they're inspired, and we know that they have worth and value, Lord, and they'll not return void. God, would your spirit be at work in our hearts and our minds today as we respond to your grace. We pray this in your name. Amen. By the way, these jeans are not meant to kneel. If you just saw me, I was kneeling and I almost had to leave and go home and get another pair of pants. So, on that note, let's begin with the word of God. So today we're going to deal with three main points, but we want to center this around one major idea. This is our main idea for the day, that your union matters to God. Not only does it matter to God, but it belongs to God. Your union matters and belongs to God, and here's this, to the rest of the world. So your relationship with God does not just matter between you, God, and your spouse, but everyone else sees your union as a witness of what God has done. So your union matters to God, belongs to God, And it matters to the rest of the world, too. So we want to begin with our first point today. And we're going to go through this today a little quick. And all God's people said? All right. So our first idea for today is our marriages are deeply missional. We are called and sent to our spouse to communicate God's love to him and her. Last week, we spent a long time talking about what marriage really is. Marriage is, in its most boiled-down form, glorifying God and its discipleship because you're called to love your spouse and to nurture them along as well. And, and interestingly enough, that the way that you sharpen something is you rub two pieces together. So iron sharpens iron. A spouse is sharpening the other spouse. And so you just can't have a dull knife rubbing up against a brick. You both got to be semi-dull to start out with. Amen? Okay, good. So our marriages are deeply missional. Missional is a weird word. It's one of those Christian buzzwords that kind of lose its value, kind of like the word authentic. Oh, we just want to be really authentic. I don't know what that means anymore, but mission and missional has much value to us because our marriages are deeply missional means that our marriages are centered around the mission of God. 
to reach lost people, to the evangelization of the nations. Interesting enough, we try to just say that that's our individual job or that's the church's job, but it's your job to also be a witness to the world through your marriage. Our marriages are deeply missional. We are called and sent to our spouse to communicate God's love to him and her. You never thought that you'd be a missionary in your own marriage, did you? You never thought that you'd be a missionary in your own friendships, and your own relationships. Um, I always thought if you're in a dating relationship, missionary dating is a bad idea. Um, to try to go out and, and save the other person is probably in your best interest to find someone who's already saved and get them sanctified. Can I get an amen? So, you are a missionary to your spouse, and one of the primary modes of mission is that we pray for our spouse. We remind them continually of not just how much we love them, but how much Jesus loves them. I want to talk to you today about 1 Peter 3, verse 7. I love 1 Peter 3 because a large chunk of 1 Peter is talking about how the Christians behave in a non-believing world. And this is super important for us, this passage. The same goes for you, husbands. Listen up. Be good husbands to your wives. Honor them. Delight in them. As women, they lack some of your advantages. Many translations will say that the woman is weaker or a weaker vessel. And I don't want any man to leave here today with a black eye. So we look for a translation that told us a little more about the broad context of what's going on. As women, they lack some of your advantages. But in the new life of God's grace, you are equals. So treat your wives then as equals so your prayers don't run aground. Interestingly enough, I, I love the phrase, they lack some of your advantages. It, it, it talks about marriage within the context of an unbelieving world. Now, at the time that this was written, women don't have a lot of privileges. They even don't have a lot of privileges in the new movement of following Jesus. They're kind of subjugated. They're kind of set aside. They, they probably use jokes like women should wear white to match the rest of the appliances, which is a terrible joke and should never be said in anybody's household. I'm sure some of you laugh because you've used that once or twice. He says, no, women are not just thing to be put under your feet, to be run on, to be talked about. You don't treat your wife like the rest of the world treats wife. They're not property. They don't belong to you. First and foremost, they belong to God. He says, they don't have the same opportunities that maybe you have, that men are given. Uh, likely, some women didn't have education. They couldn't own property. They didn't really have a voting status in society. But he says, no, 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 no. The new creation mandate, Jesus has called us to a new life, a new way of living, because we belong to his kingdom and no other earthly kingdom. That means we act differently, we respond differently than the rest of the world. And because of this, we have to understand that sometimes they lack some of our advantages. But in the new life of God's grace, Jesus has called us into new creation. We're no longer the same us, we no longer behave the same way, we no longer do the same things. But in the new life of God's grace, you're equals. So treat your wives then as equals so your prayers don't run themselves to the ground. The prayers of a righteous man has, they, uh, the prayers of a righteous man work as they, blah, 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 blah. powerful and effective. I'm thinking of availeth much and my mind doesn't work in the King James so you'll feel, excuse me. The prayers of a righteous man availeth much as they are working. There we go. Have power as they are working. There you go. I should have gone back in a contemporary translation and tried to put that in my head. So part of our deeply missional position of our marriage is to not only remind our spouse of their love, you can do a lot by just reminding them, but if you don't treat them that way, part of what 1 Peter 3 does is remind us that we honor them and delight in them. That's more than words. It involves actions as well. We esteem them to a high place in God's relationship. Now, we're going to get to this in just a second in another passage, but it's really easy to tell your spouse that they're loved, but it's much more difficult to convince them that they are lovable or that they can be loved. So our call to be missionaries in our relationship is not just in words, but also in deeds, because platitudes don't go a long way if you don't follow them up with action, if you don't love and cherish your wife as the good gift that they're called to do. Likewise, if women don't think that their husbands are worth their salt, Ephesians 5 reminds women to respect their husbands and arise husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church in full sacrifice and love and in forgiveness and in mercy, but not just in what we say, but also in what we do. Because what God has done, he has set apart something that got taken apart and 
taken over by the world, and we see what marriage looks like today. That is open to our interpretation. It does not follow a biblical, historical, orthodox understanding of the Christian faith, and we've really kind of run it into the ground. I would assume that part of this is because we stopped treating marriage like the sanctified work that it is. That God calls marriage is to be set apart. And you can say that your marriage is set apart, but if you don't love your spouse, if you don't love your friends, if you don't love your relationships, your children, differently than the rest of the world does, that's not a very good missionary witness, right? So our marriages are deeply missional, and we're called and sent to our spouse to communicate God's love to him and to her. Every marriage has one responsibility. Can you go to the next slide, Tanya? No, go back. I'm sorry. That was my bad. Every marriage, married couple has one job description, to convince their spouse they are loved and that they are lovable. Again, this is incredibly difficult because you can say I love you, you can do things to propagate that love, but to convince them that they can be loved in the first place, and there's a lot of things that we carry, baggage of the past that we carry into relationships. Maybe you did not have a good father, maybe you didn't have a father at all. Maybe you were in past abusive relationships, and you just cannot convince yourself that why would this other individual love me, and why would God ever love me in the first place? Does that make you stop loving your spouse? Does it make you stop being missional and reminding them of what God has done for you? Absolutely not. That should encourage you for the mission, that I'm going to do whatever it takes for you to see what Jesus has done for you in our marriage and in our relationships and in our lives and with our children. Um, I want to talk about Jesus. I want to be reminded of his good and wonderful gifts, that everything I have is not because of what I've done, because of what he's already given me. And our children and our finances and our material provisions are a sign of God's and wonderful grace because you can be loved. And likewise, we're always telling that to our spouse. And sometimes in marriages, we feel kind of worthless. Sometimes, I'll never do anything right. <laughs> Anyone ever feel like that? I can never do anything right ever. I'm always doing wrong things. You're always barking down each other's throats. But that's not good news. And that's not reminding of your spouse, of what Jesus has done for them. Our marriages are deeply missional. And this makes me think of our next point. You didn't just get married in a church, though you probably did, but you got married for the church, for the advancement of the gospel, for the bride of Christ, and you got married for the world. Because your marriage is a testimony to what God has done. Our marriages are a sign of God's love. I'm going to brag on two people in our congregation Ray and Sherry Burkhalter, whenever I look at Ray and Sherry Burkhalter, I think, I want a marriage like that. I do. You ever look at uh, maybe an older couple in your life and think, how do they still do it? Maybe uh, a couple that's maybe a little hands-on and a little kissy-kissy, and you think, any much longer and their dentures are going to fall out? That's not Ray and Sherry, but that's somebody that we can think of. It's because they live and behave in such a way that make me say, I want a love like that. We have to remind ourselves that our job is not just to witness to our spouse, but to witness to the rest of the world. Our marriage is a sign of God's love. I love Proverbs 30, verses 18 and 19. It really talks about the mystery of marriage. We have a lot to comprehend. He says, there are three things that amaze me. No, four things that I simply do not understand. Next slide. How an eagle glides through the sky, don't know. How a snake slithers on the rock, how a ship navigates the ocean. But the fourth thing I don't understand is how a man loves a woman. Um, as I said the last couple weeks, marriage is like two porcupines cuddling. You're putting two difficult, sinful, prideful individuals who want dominance in the relationship and you're putting them together and you're asking it to work. That's the fourth thing we don't understand, how a man loves a woman. But Christian marriages are uniquely placed in society to make it work because it's neither the man nor the woman who is ahead of the relationship. It's Jesus Christ who is ahead of the relationship and ahead of the church. And so we talked about last week, Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's not about what you want. It's not about what your spouse wants. It's not what about what they think they want. It's about what Jesus wants in the relationship. And he wants holiness, and he wants repentance, and he wants obedience, and he wants you to live in a manner worthy of your calling. 
And his calling is that he's set you aside from the foundation of the earth to draw all people unto himself. And he uses your marriage as an example for what a good, godly relationship looks like. Now, with this, the next slide, I think the church then has a deep need to see married people in love. Have you ever been like this, or do you know someone like this? Uh, on your way to church, your whole family's fighting like cats and dogs, and you're just getting ready to execute everyone in the car, but when you show up, you put on your smile face? Come on. You're with me. But when we walk through the doors, we suddenly change face, and we're suddenly new people who do different things. The world wants to see that all the time, that you're full of grace, and you're full of understanding, and you're easy and quick to forgive, and you're merciful, because there's a lot of mercy not given in the, in the marriage relationship, because you'd like to hold on to it and use it for later as ammo for the conversation that you'll have in a couple of days. That's not what God calls us to. But he calls us to be a signpost of God's love in the world, that we can look at married relationships, that we can look at good, godly-centered friendships, and we can look at parenting relationships and think, this is the mystery that God has done in the world, and now I get to see what the mystery looks like. Because how God could ever love me is a complete mystery in and of itself, and how God could ever love you, and some of you, I know that to be absolutely sure, how he could love you is a mystery to begin with. But when I look at a married couple who embody that, I'll use Ray and Sherry as an example, I see that's the way that God's love works in the world. I want a love like that. And it does that because they live in a way that's for other people to give glory to God. Interestingly enough, last week we talked about what is the chief end of man? This is in the Westminster Confession. It says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Your marriage is to bring glory to God, and you're not just glorifying God yourself, but you're glorifying God in the presence of somebody else. And God has called you to that. The world should be able to look at our marriages and at our relationships and say, I want a love like that. Likewise, as individuals, we need to live in a way that says, I want your God to be my God. I want your Jesus to be my Jesus. I want what you worship to be what I worship. That we live in such a transparent and radiant way that God's love is always a result. That means that you don't carry around grudges when your spouse does something boneheaded because it's inevitably, inevitably going to happen. That means that, uh, what's the old adage, don't go to bed angry? Because who wants to be angry in the first place? I don't want to wake up angry. I don't want to live my life in an angry way. But I want to be reminded of God's forgiveness. Again, this is why every marriage has to preach the gospel to themselves, not just as individuals, but as married relationships. Because when you say that you can't forgive your spouse, what you're really saying in essence is that God could never really forgive me. But because he can forgive you, he has forgiven you, you will forgive your spouse. That's a pretty simple formula, but it's much more difficult to put into practice. Keyword, it takes lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of practice. When you come to your spouse and you say, hey, I sinned against you, will you forgive me? Their response may be, yeah, but you did this, this, and this, and this, and say, no, 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 will you forgive me? That's what we should be searching for. Now, the marriage is an analogy. Now, let's go to the last slide. All analogies are imperfect. Again, marriages are a mystery because the gospel is a mystery. There's no other earthly relationship that tells us of God's beauty for us. It doesn't tell us, it's the only thing that even comes close to telling us about Jesus' love for the church and God's love for his son. All analogies are imperfect, but marriage is the least inadequate analogy for our relationship with God. I want to go to Genesis 2, 18 through 25, and I want us to just look at really what marriage is. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. It's the only thing that wasn't good. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, by the way, which would be an incredibly fun job. If you could look at all the creation and decide their different names and what nicknames you'd like to give them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that's, that was its name. I'm thankful that Adam had a developed vocabulary or else we'd look at an elephant and go, Ugh. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. 
So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep, deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. This also orchestrates how we are to behave in our relationships. God did not take Eve from his front, from his behind, but his side to be a companion, to be a helper, to be a suitable mate for all of life. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. I love this. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. What the translators do here in verse 23 is they boil everything down to one phrase. Whoa, man. Woman, get it? That is why a man leaves his father and mother, and is united to his wife, that they become one flesh. And Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. All analogies are imperfect, but marriage is the least inadequate analogy of our relationship with God. Interestingly enough, that after they're created, it says that they felt no shame. This shows the intimacy of our relationships. That it shows us that it's something protected by God. There is no shame within our union with God. Now, interestingly enough, he takes an incomplete Adam and he pairs it with an incomplete Eve. I almost just thought of a good science joke. Uh, he split the Adam. I'll, I'll let Doc do the dad jokes. <laughs> so he takes an incomplete Adam and an incomplete Eve, and what does he do? He makes them whole. It's an imperfect analogy because it deals with imperfect people and imperfect relationships and imperfect areas of our life. But what it does is it shows that there's wholeness. And there's only wholeness as far as God is involved in our relationship. You can't just decide to put one broken individual with another broken individual and make it work. There's only one thing that can mesh all of our wounds, heal all of our hurts, and bring two unforgiving, unmerciful, unloving, unsanctified people together, and that's the work of Jesus Christ. And interestingly enough, just as we were created, he calls us to a form of intimacy, of love and mercy and grace and forgiveness, nakedness, if you will, complete vulnerability. And what he calls us to get together when he brings a broken man and a broken woman together, he calls them back to that same thing. The story of the fall is that a man wants authority over the relationship, a woman wants authority over the relationship, and it's one giant fight. But Jesus, because he's in the middle of it, calls us back to that same nakedness, that vulnerability. And it's not just for us. Again, this is for the whole world. The whole world gets to see how two broken, unforgiving, unlovable, unworking people come together to form one coherent, loving relationship. And again, it's a signpost for God's love because it says, I want my love to be like that. And that should make us want to be in relationship with older individuals who do have that love. Um, just like in discipleship, you need a mentor to help you through the faith. It's really difficult to disciple yourself. If I taught myself how to work on your car engine, you probably shouldn't pay me. <laughs> you should probably go buy a new car. But if I've sat under the mentorship of a skilled craftsman, technician, you can probably trust that I'll have a, a job well done after some time. Likewise, we should submit our, our marriages to the same thing, that we'll have godly marriages ahead of us. So we need to find older, wise, seasoned individuals of our life who have been through the crap to figure out how we do this. Because it brings us back to our main idea. Our union matters to God and to the rest of the world because our marriage is a signpost for God's love. And to be honest, people are looking at you to see if this is going to work. Um, I've had the honor and privilege of, of doing some college ministry in my time. And like every young person who thinks they're a Christian, thinks that they want to get married, every adage about Bible college and seminary is that they go there to get married. But they're scared about marriage. They're scared about marriage because... Globs and globs and globs of people have failed them and not being a faithful signpost for God's love. Maybe we talked about it in last week's because we're eager to give up. We're eager to place blame. We're eager to 
not be invested and involved in other people's relationships. Interestingly enough, that there is an increased accountability when you invest in somebody's life to teach them. And there's no other better preparation than to teach somebody. Like, if I said, Cam, you're going to come up and finish the next 10 minutes of the lesson next week, he would spend a good portion of his week in study and in preparation for what God would have you to say. So our signpost for God's love is not running by the seat of our pants, but it's being deeply invested in one another, being deeply invested in Jesus Christ personally, so that we can be deeply invested in other people. Because your union matters to God and to the rest of the world. Amen? I want us to think about our response today to this message. To our three points. I want us to ask first the question, are our marriages intent on the gospel? And are they intent on sharing the gospel? Do we really believe that our marriages are a sign of God's love? And if they are, what do we need to change? And what do I need to remove so that my marriage, my depiction of what Jesus has done for me is less dirty and more faithful to what he's done? Basically, we're asking the question for the Holy Spirit to move into our lives, into our hearts, into our marriage beds, and to get out whatever doesn't belong there. And for some of us, that's going to be a painful, long road. But God has so graciously, sovereignly designed the local church to come alongside families, men and women, individuals, to heal those broken relationships. And I'm thankful for that. Because what he has designed, it is meant to be beautiful, and it's meant to look like him. And as we've just celebrated a year of pastoring this church, I want to see more and more marriages that look like Jesus. I want to see more and more relationships reconciled. I want to see more and more people find newfound joy in their life. I want to see more and more people enjoy rather than endure. I want to see more and more people bring younger couples alongside them and say, this is how marriage ought to work. And let me tell you, because I've been through the ringer once or twice before. I want to see beautiful children raised in a healthy environment. I want to see grandkids know what it's like. Maybe if they've come from an incomplete home, I want to, at least for them to see an incomplete system. I mean, a complete system with Jesus Christ at the center. We're in a prime position to do that. We're small enough to be so relationally packed that it'll work. But that requires our nakedness. Not only our nakedness to our spouse, but our nakedness to one another. And of course, I'm not talking about a real nakedness. Add a little humor in there. I'm talking about our vulnerability, that we'll need the help along the way. What are they, what's the adage? It doesn't take, a, doesn't take a family to raise a child, but it takes a whole village. Better yet, I think it takes a church. It takes a church to nurture a marriage and nurture individuals. But it begins first in submission. Are you willing to do this? Are you willing to make it work? the good, the bad, and the ugly, not for you, but for Jesus, but for Jesus. I think if you'll ask that question, I would be surprised at how many people would agree with a resounding yes. I'll make it work for Jesus. Let's look at our marriages, our relationships, our vocations, our callings, everything that we're covenanted to with that value. Am I willing to make this work for Jesus? Can we do that? Let's pray and we'll invite the worship team up. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for the truths that you've given us, that our marriages, our relationships, our friendships, our parenting relationships are not, 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 not about us. But they're about you and what you've done for us, what we didn't deserve, what we still don't deserve, what we'll never deserve, but you did it anyway. God, you've called us to wholeness, to completeness, to what a beautiful union with you at the center looks like. I'm thankful for the many, many examples that you've given our church I'm thankful for the many, many examples that you'll continue to raise up. God, and for anybody who doesn't feel like they fit, or maybe because of its singleness, by death, divorce, separation, choice, whatever, God, I, I pray that you'll allow them to be king of your heart, of their hearts, uh, of their lives, of their decisions. Lord, I pray that they'll find their sufficiency in you. Lord, may they not feel ostracized by a Christian subculture that says they have to do this. God, may they be indebted to you. May they find their refuge and their solace in what you have done for them 
and let them not fall into the trap of comparison. Lord, again, we want to see whole families and whole individuals because we believe it's a picture of the gospel, a picture of what you've done for us. Lord, may we respond to these many, many questions with one single question. Are we willing to do it for your son? Lord, build your kingdom. Don't let us get in the way. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen.